Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. This is the second Prentice Institute seminar that we've uh, instituted since my joining the Prentice Institute in January. And very pleased to see people joining us this afternoon. I'm sure there are other things on the sun, at least it's very sunny here in Camro. So I'm sure the, the lure of the outside after a long winter is <laughs> taking its toll. So I'd like to begin by saying Oki okay, and welcome to the University of Lethbridge. Our university's Blackfoot name is Inniskim, meaning sacred buffalo stone. The university is located in traditional Blackfoot Confederacy territory. We honor the Blackfoot peoples and the traditional ways of knowing and caring for this land, as well as all Aboriginal peoples who have helped shape and continue to strengthen our university community. So welcome again, just a few quick announcements from the Prentice Institute before we begin. Some general reminders. First of all, the call for affiliates is still open. The deadline for that is April 15th, if I remember correctly. And there is an associated call for research proposals as well. Both the uh, affiliates funding stream and the seed grant streams are still open. And just as a heads up for faculty, we will be opening up the call for graduate student funding uh, in the next few weeks. The previous seminar that was conducted last month with Dr. Adole is now available on the Prentice Institute YouTube channel and a link that is available to that from the Prentice Institute website. And I'm pleased to announce that we have another seminar scheduled for next month with the Institute's postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Um, MD Kamrul Islam, and his presentation is Promoting Health Facility-Based Delivery in South Africa, Examining the Role of Social Factors using a multi-level modeling in a multi-country setting. So a large database initiative there. That will be on April 16th. So please do join us for that. I'm sure Cameron will appreciate the audience and the feedback. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Constantine Posadas, who is a professor of economics at the University of New Brunswick, a Dobbins scholar in Ireland, Onanassis Foundation fellow from Greece, of course, and a member of the Academic Scientific Board of the International Institute of Advanced Economic and Social Studies in Italy. He has served as a member of the Economic Council of Canada, chairman of the New Brunswick Human Rights Commission, founding president of the New Brunswick Multicultural Council, and chair of the New Brunswick Advisory Board on Population Growth. Professor Pisaris is the recipient of the 125th Canada Medal and the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. And I'm very pleased to welcome our distinguished speaker here today, all the way from New Brunswick, three hours ahead of us on a Friday afternoon. So coasting, coasting into what is traditionally believed, I believe is called a sundown or a cocktail hour. But first he has to survive the next hour of um, deep and penetrating inquisition from the audience. So with that, Dr. Pasares, I will turn it over to you and Jeff to manage the PowerPoint. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much, uh, Lars, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. And my May I extend to you a warm welcome to the Prentice Institute uh, family. Greetings uh, to my uh, friends and colleagues at the Prentice and everybody who is watching us live through this uh, webinar. I have uh, very fond memories of my visit to the Prentice in 2011 as a visiting national research affiliate and meeting with the Prentice family as well as faculty and students at the University of Lethbridge. I would like to thank the organizers of uh, this event for their kind invitation and would like to extend a special shout out to Jeff Bingley, who ha it has been a pleasure to work with him in bringing this event to its final destination. In the past, in the good old days, Preparing for a presentation such as this seems to be a fairly easy job. All you had to do was to send the topic, a brief outline of the presentation, and a short bio. Well, folks, things have changed. 
These days, in addition to doing all of the things that I mentioned, you need to pass a screen test, a sound check, uh, participate in an audition, and then even have a dress rehearsal. So the standard has shifted upwards along with many other things. I'm speaking to you from Fredericton, New Brunswick, through the services of the internet. And folks, I would have preferred to avoid the drama of a global pandemic in order to make my point that we are living in the age of internetization. Next slide, please. Welcome to the age of internetization. For most of you, this is a new word and a new concept. Let me be clear. I did not set out to coin a new word. It happened when I was preparing a lecture on the three pillars of the new global economy of the 21st century. One of those pillars was globalization. And I started to grumble about the word globalization as being inappropriate. So at first, I started looking for a synonym. But finding nothing that was adequate enough, I resorted to some original wordsmithing. And that is how I coined the word internetization. Next slide, please. Globalization is the interconnectedness of our world. It is captured in Marshall McLuhan's book title, The Global Village. The reason I was grumbling about the word globalization was that the word has at least two defects. First, there is nothing new about the word globalization. It has been going on since time immemorial. Think of the Babylonian and the Roman empires, the military conquests of Alexander the Great, Marco Polo's Silk Road to China, and more recently, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who stood up in the House of Commons and made a speech saying the sun never sets on the British Empire. This wasn't part of a political extension of reality, it was in fact true because all the way from China to North America, at some point in time, the sun was shining over the British empire during the 24 hour cycle. The second reason I was grumbling about the word globalization was that it did not project the electronic connectivity that is part of the reality of today's world. Next slide, please. The word digitization was not, in my opinion, an appropriate synonym. Digitization refers to the conversion of text, wages, and sound to a digital format. 
but it is silent with respect to global outreach. In consequence, internetization has elongated the conceptual reach and global outreach of digitization. Next slide, please. Internetization is a marriage of opportunity between globalization and digitization. It embraces the global outreach of globalization and enhances it with the electronic capacity of digitization. In short, Internetization is globalization on steroids and digitization with a global outreach. In effect, internetization has defeated time and geography. Internetization has revolutionized our economic, social, and political interactions. Hardly a day goes by when we are not reminded of our dependence on the internet, from the way we shop, bank, work, travel, entertain ourselves, and conduct our civic responsibilities. The electronic prefix in the vast majority of our daily routine sums it all up. Email, e-learning, e-banking, e-commerce, e-government, and on and on and on. As you will see in the slide, access to the internet has grown exponentially. In a few decades, starting with its introduction in the 1990s to the present time where practically half of the world's population is online. Next slide, please. So far, the 21st century does not appear to be our lucky century. In fact, the first three decades of the 21st century are best described as our seculum horribile, or our horrible century. We have witnessed a cataclysmic trifecta. It started with the global financial crisis of 2008, which brought our financial institutions to their knees. It was followed by the protracted Great Recession that revealed the Herculean challenges of structural unemployment. And in the third decade, we have waged war against the most devastating global pandemic of our lifetime. So far, the world has recorded 118 million infections from this virus and 2.6 million deaths. Next slide, please. COVID-19 spread shock and awe around the world. It destroyed our comfortable and normal lifestyle on many levels. The best impact statement about COVID-19 that I heard did not come from an economist, a sociologist, or an epidemiologist. 
It came from the mouth of a six-year-old who looked at me in the eyes and said, these are his own words, this macaroni virus has ruined my life. Why doesn't he want me to go to school to see my teachers and play with my friends? My friends, this from a generation that relishes snow days. Snow days are those days when students get the day off because of the harsh and inclement Canadian winters that we face. It took a devastating pandemic to realize how dependent we have become on internetization. Computers and electronic connectivity have become an essential and necessary enabler of our contemporary existence. This is what I mean by the age of internetization. Next slide, please. The age of internetization has empowered us to transport our office to our homes, conduct our children's schooling from home, avoid the supermarket and shop online. Last year, we celebrated birthdays, enjoyed weddings, and held funerals through the services of the internet. We even attended musical concerts and watched our favorite sports teams virtually. All of this confirms the importance of internetization to the new global order of the 21st century. And yet, on a global comparative scale, we have a big problem. Internetization has revealed the fault lines as well as the uneven and asymmetric impact of COVID-19 between developed and developing countries. The reason for this is the digital divide in the form of the digital infrastructure and electronic connectivity between developed and developing countries. The slide that you are seeing right now bears witness to the fact that developing countries are falling behind on both counts. Next slide, please. The economic impact of COVID-19 has been uneven and asymmetric. It has revealed the fault lines in economic policy and spotlighted the inequality within and between countries. The economic impact of COVID-19 is best understood by a global comparison between developed and developing countries. COVID-19 has widened the economic disparity between developed and developing countries. The most recent World Bank report concludes that on many fronts, developing countries have been disproportionately affected. 
their GDP has shrunk, poverty has increased, and immigrant remittances, which are higher than foreign aid for developing countries, has declined. The social safety net that kicked in for developed countries was non-existent for developing countries. Next slide, please. And I'm going to zero in on two facets of where internetization has failed developing countries. The first case is when government lockdowns and stay-at-home directives stalled the economies of the developed countries, they brought the economies of developing countries to a total standstill. Internetization emerged as the savior of the economic landscape for developed countries as the workforce defaulted to working from home through the services of the internet. That was not an option for the millions of rice planters, rickshaw pullers, laborers, and street vendors in developing countries. Next slide, please. The same scenario played out between developed and developing countries in the educational sector. 1.6 billion students worldwide had their education impact. However, developed countries were able to juxtapose their electronic capacity to transition from in-class and in-person learning to online and distance learning. In consequence, students in developed countries attending schools, colleges, and universities were able to continue their studies and graduate on time. This story did not have a similar happy ending for developing countries. In this case, schools and universities were abruptly closed. Students were sent home until further notice. The learning process and the creation of human capital was put on hold. All of this because of a lack of digital infrastructure and electronic capacity in developing countries. Next slide, please. COVID-19 and the ascendance of internetization has reinvigorated Yogi Berra's prediction that the future ain't what it used to be. Our future will be defined by accelerated speed and constant change. We will witness significant disruptions in the form of industrialization, automation, robotics, internetization, and the internet of things. In this scenario, education and the creation of human capital will rise 
to an iconic pedestal. The paradigm for the wealth of nations is no longer defined by the resources under our feet, but by the brain power between our ears. Next slide, please. There is no denying that we are living through a period of crisis. The Chinese word for crisis, which you see in this slide, consists of two characters. The first is danger. The second is more complicated, as you can see by the graphic because it embodies change that leads to opportunity. This is the spirit of the message that I want to leave with you today, to seek the opportunities rather than focusing on a global pandemic because that too will pass. But this could be a crisis that leads us to new opportunities for the near and distant future. And I will leave you with three thoughts in terms of where we need to go in order to take advantage of those opportunities in the near and distant future. First, we need to embrace internetization as our ally in the service of humanity. Second, we need to envision a new economic development model that will eliminate the digital divide and close the gap of economic disparity between developed and developing countries. Third, we need to launch a new era of collaborative multilateralism that will resolve in a purposeful manner the contemporary hot button issues of the post COVID-19 economic recovery. Hot button issues such as climate change, sustainable development, global po poverty, which in the process cannot be resolved unilaterally, but will need a global effort and a multilateral approach to resolving those immediate challenges that humanity is facing in the 21st century. And with that, let me thank you for your attention, and I look forward to engaging with you in a conversation and discussion in the minutes that we have left. Well, and, and thank you very much, Constantine, and my, my few remaining words of Greek, uh, Ephalisto, for your, your words and your um, observations today. I have asked people to submit any questions in the Q and A, um, but I'll also start because you're, this covers quite a bit of some projects that I've been involved in. So I'll, I'll prime the pump, so to speak, with a few questions for you. Um, first of all, part of, I think, what you're speaking to here from an equity standpoint, whether it's infrastructural or socio-demographic, um, comes down to the question of access as service. 
and therefore the question of how we view access as a public good or don't view it as a public good and some of those broader distributive questions. Um, so I'm wondering if you could maybe speak a little bit to some, some of the dynamics around internet provision as one element of the digital divide and different ways of thinking about, just as we might from a public health standpoint, think about drinking water, if, if there maybe needs to be a shift in how we think about the provision and maintenance of infrastructure for uh, a, a deeply digital planet. Uh, related to that then is the question of, of course, as a political scientist, let's talk about the, the tension between uh, private sector and market-based instruments versus governmental <laughs> interventions. And, and lastly, maybe if you could just provide a few observations about the demography of the digital divide and the reality that all populations do not distribute, you know, naturally the planetary level we have a split between high, you know, sorry, I've got some feedback here to the, to the point where I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but there's sort of a joke conspiracy theory going around that the Jetsons and the Flintstones, the cartoon shows actually happen at the same time. It's a dystopian future and you know, the, Jet the Jetsons have internet and the Flintstones clearly do not. Um, but, but within that, there are other more nuanced, uh, social and regional, um, rural versus urban, uh, and international questions as well. So I'll just put that out there to start the ball rolling, so to speak. Thank you. What an excellent uh, start to a conversation, uh, Lars, because this is really the crux of the issue here at this point in time. Even within Canada, even within developed countries, when we were forced to default to an intensely internetized world, we found that even developed countries had issues. We found that there was a gap in terms of the provision of services and the adequacy of the internet with respect to some pockets in the most advanced countries in the world. Multiply that by 10 and you get a sense of the rift between developed and developing countries. So absolutely, I think this is something that we need to look at very seriously. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of my students has come up with the idea that we, we should start talking about internetization as a human right, that we should start looking at the provision of access to what has become our lifeblood, our economic lifeblood, as a means that should not be disproportioned by, by whether you have access to it or not, or whether you have the financial capacity to pay the bills for internet access, that should be a provision that is provided in an equitable manner to all the citizens because it is such a vital part of our existence in the future. So this uh, <clears throat> clearly is something that is on the mind and on the radar of a large number of people and uh, we will have to, now that we have been forced to acknowledge that the internet is such an important foundation of our lifestyle and our existence, how we are going to provide this service and this connectivity to every member of the global community in terms of the developing and developed countries, but also within countries that we don't have this chasm between those who can afford to be on and have access to the internet and those who can. But that's only a start to answering your question. And I think it will be on the mind of scholars and public policy practitioners 
from every day until uh, we have resolved this this issue. Yeah, I I can I can tell you that many small municipalities are thinking differently about where just infrastructural provision fits within their service profile, uh, and thinking about at least localized public free um, Wi-Fi high bandwidth Wi-Fi, and not as an economic development intervention, but as a sociocultural intervention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have some questions that are related to this in the, um, the chat. So I'll read out the question just to uh, keep things simple. So with greetings from Nigeria. What actions could be put in place to bridge the digital divide between Global South and Global North, which you've already started to touch on? Do you want to add a little bit more to that broader planetary perspective? Was the uh, person who was asking the question going to add something or you wanted me to respond, Lars? No, I, I think if you can respond, they can only submit questions via text, so. All right. So our uh, greetings and our appreciation that people in Nigeria are watching this webinar. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Clearly, uh, I think one of the things that COVID has, has forced us to acknowledge is that the solution to our emerging problems is not one that can be solved at the national level. When we talk about the motto, we're in this together, never have those words been more appropriate that in terms of confronting the challenges and the opportunities of the world as it is today. The digital divide is one of the issues that I think we need to look at, at in a multi-layered manner. Perhaps we can focus foreign aid in that direction, but we also need to acknowledge that developed countries have a responsibility and a personal benefit from bridging the digital divide because bringing the rest of the world to participate in the actions of the future is essential. The digital divide, as uh, Lars pointed out, is not simply an economic derivative, but has social political connections. For example, the developed world was able to use the internet to provide health advisories and use the social uh, uh, network to advise people about uh, clusters of COVID-19 infections and what to do and what to avoid doing. But in the developing world, where access to the internet has not become a mode of operation that is available to the large number of people, those urgent advisories and those life and death notices were not able to be sent out. So while I'm speaking to you as an economist, I am very cognizant of the social considerations and the political considerations that internetization has provided us with the capacity and we need to take this opportunity and extend it to every corner of the world. Lars, you're muted. Too many buttons in my life. Sorry about that. Uh, so we have two more questions. Uh, first one, which is directly related. 
Authors such as Massey have argued that rising income and other social inequalities are leading to the demise of the social contract and potentially demise of civilizations. What are your thoughts on internetization accelerating this? I uh, potentially see that uh, the person who asked this question is on very solid ground unless we do something to correct the inequality. And while those inequalities are staring us in the face with respect to a comparison between developed and developing countries, they are also a sensitive point that needs to be addressed within developed countries. So those inequalities that emerge as a result of the lack of internetization need to be addressed not only at the global level, but also nationally if we are to have a cohesive, well-functioning social fabric that will address the economic, social, cultural challenges that we are going to face. So I, I agree with, with the, the premise of uh, the question that was raised. Okay, two more questions. Um, the first is related to um, policy and in particular deficit-based financing, particularly right now by large governments. The question is, given that almost every government in the world is running massive deficits by, quote, printing more money, is that a big issue? Does that money have to be paid? And if so, to whom? And I think this relates in part to the infrastructural question and the provision question uh, in terms of internet and digital uh, service provision? Clearly, uh, when I mentioned that the social safety net that developed countries resorted to in order to provide financial support to people who were affected by COVID-19 has increased the debt situation for advanced industrialized countries. That option was not available to developing countries because the financial capacity wasn't there and they had another more difficult social problem to deal with from a public policy perspective which was whether to save lives or protect livelihoods. Saving lives meant from a medical standpoint, what was medical science telling us to avoid large groups, to avoid going to school, to avoid going to work, but in the case of the developing world, that wasn't a real option because creating hunger, creating uh, famines was an equally death notice in those countries themselves. So the dilemma, there is a philosophical and, and a moral dilemma here that resulted in developing countries opening up their economies much more quickly because they were prepared to take the risk of an increase in infections rather than face massive famines, massive hunger, and a total collapse of their economic system. So that's one parallel thought that I want to bring in. There is another thought that I want to add, and that is clearly the mounting debt, the mounting public debt that has been accumulated as a result of COVID 
is going to have to be paid in the future. I don't want to be the bearer of bad news on a sunny Friday afternoon, but folks, people in the developed world can expect increases in taxes once we get over the hump of the worst final wave of COVID-19, because I don't see anything else that is avoidable. Printing money is not an option. Inflation of 30, 35% is not an option. Those debts that governments have accumulated have to be paid. Sooner or later, the bill is going to come in the, in the mail. And the only way that governments will be able to do that is to raise taxes. So folks, <laughs> brace yourselves. There might be another wave of cataclysmic effects coming that is not related to COVID infection. Except in Alberta, because we never raise taxes in Alberta. Let's not forget that. We're okay. We'll be all right. Just want to reassure everybody. Here, no, no taxes, no raised income taxes, no raised corporate taxes, and no sales tax. The premier said so. Uh, another question then that relates to this and, and goes back up to the global level is, uh, do you support the formulation, creation, or establishment of a global organization that would foster and potentially govern equitable internetization? It's a loaded question. It's, it's a loaded question, but I think it's a very appropriate question. And I thank uh, the person who uh, put this on the table. Uh, one of the three fundamental take home messages that I wanted to leave the audience with is the issue that we have to revisit and reinvigorate our multilateral uh, governance and policy. Now, we do have some institutions of multilateral governance, like the World Bank, that the IMF, the, the World Health Organization, and uh, others like that. But I think we will need to revisit them and retweak them to make them more engaged uh, with the reality of internetization. The World Trade Organization has started on this uphill battle, especially with, with intellectual property, which was not part of the general agreement on tariffs and trade when it got started. So some of those multilateral organizations are taking the hint and moving along slowly, but at least they're moving in the right direction. Now, the other thing about internetization is that there are days when I feel that I'm living in the wild west. The internet looks like there's nobody there, anybody, Everybody can do anything they want, and there are no controls, no checks, no balances. So I think the spirit of the question is that we may need to look at founding some new multilateral organizations that are specifically engaged with the element of internetization since it will continue to be a foundational aspect of how we move forward. If that is the case, there are a lot of things that need to be ironed out. Difficult as that is going to be, bringing 192 countries around the table to sign on the dot dotted line, but at least that conversation needs to start 
because already we are seeing glimpses that there is an ugly face to internetization. We are seeing countries, uh, for example, the good old days when the James, James Bond type of spies were going around the world gathering intelligence and information are behind us. Now they don't have to send people. They can eavesdrop on people's conversations. They can hack into your mailing addresses. They can uh, extract confidential information from governments and, and uh, businesses. They can hold to ransom the digital operation of businesses and governments at the three levels, municipal, uh, provincial, federal. All of that suggests to me that the stakes are high and we need to bring some control that on a national basis cannot be done. No country can say, my country is safe from international hacking because I have a policy and legislation that nobody can do that. Well, we, you can't do that in a world where boundaries, geographical boundaries do, don't mean anything. COVID-19 showed us that Infections will move from one country to the other, and they don't need a passport to enter. The same is true of the digital world, where cyber security is becoming one of the most uh, challenging issues that we need to resolve, and it cannot be resolved at a unilateral level. We need everybody working together in tandem at a multilateral level in order to make any progress in that direction. Thank you. And we do have another, we have a comment from uh, the audience. Uh, internetization, uh, that is the pervasive effects of the internet on social and economic phenomena has played an important role in international migration. At the population level, the spread of the internet has been associated with a significant increase in the scale of international migration. So some thoughts or observations, if we were to, I mean, no, no academic wants to um, prognosticate upon the future, but how does internetization 15, 20 years from now begin to play into the movement of peoples at a global scale? That, that too is a very important question. <clears throat> And one of the things I'm thinking about these days is to what extent is our traditional uh, production function going to change as a result of all those structural changes that are happening around us. I foresee a diminished role for human labor in the production function. I foresee a lot of structural unemployment as a result of internetization. I foresee that migration has already been affected by globalization. And I don't wanna start grumbling about that <laughs> today. I've done enough of that, <laughs> but Globalization has meant that offshore productivity has resulted in a diminished level of migration. Instead of businesses bringing in unskilled labor to fill the ranks of the jobs that need doing domestically because they can't find the labor supply from a national level and have gone offshore to find those jobs. Similarly, internetization will facilitate that process 
in multiple ways. However, and there is a big if in this scenario, the level of high price la uh, labor in terms of a different set of skills now. In the past, we we're talking about human capital as having reading, writing, and arithmetic. Forget about that. The new set of skills is much more complicated. It involves technological competencies, linguistic capacity, uh, an intellectual, a higher level of intellectual and academic achievement, linguistic knowledge of the cultural nuances of the world around, around us. The world is truly becoming a global village. And in that respect, one portion of the labor component, the highly educated, the highly skilled, is going to increase in terms of its importance in the production function. But then industrialization did the same thing, except that when we had the industrial revolution, the people who were displaced by the machines just walked across the street to the factory that was producing the machines and found jobs there. Well, in the age of internetization, you can't do that because you can't take people with low levels of skills that have been displaced by internetization and get them to become technically efficient as software developers, uh, computer uh, mechanics, and all those other high level and computer programmers, all those high level of uh, tasks that need to be achieved without the prerequisite levels of education and technological competence. I think that leads, and, and we're officially out of time, but we do have some spillover time here if people want to stay on. Um, but I, I think that leads to what for me would be a great sort of wrap up question. When we consider the political economy of Canada and the Staples thesis and the role of primary resource extraction and the decline of manufacturing across most parts of the country, what does internetization mean for Canada's role in a global economy in the future? Absolutely, Lars. Uh, and, and this comes to the catchy phrase that, that I used in my presentation, uh, where I say that the future, in terms of the creation of the wealth of nations, is no longer in the resources under our feet but in the brain power between our ears. This is the dynamic that is going to lead the economic uh, recovery in the post COVID world and will lead economic development in the future. In this regard, I think they're going to, we're going to need some structural changes in Canada structural changes that will divert us into exploring new opportunities that have been silent in the recent past. In a sense, Canada has been blessed that we are a country of tremendous uh, natural resources. And that level of comfort has provided us with a standard of living for a population of the size of Canada that is 37 million people, that is far above our capacity. However, I think the shock and awe of COVID-19 is going to take us into directions 
that we were a bit hesitant about taking in the last couple of decades. Uh, directions such as upping our game in terms of industrialization and mechanization and the The, the ability to manufacture our natural resources into finished products. In other words, to up our game in the economic system. The other thing that uh, is a sensitive issue to an Alberta audience would be that we, we, are, we are going to look more carefully at renewable resources and a greener economy and a cleaner economy. Because make no mistake, uh, pollution has its economic costs. It detracts from our economic development. It diminishes the quality of our lives and there is potential in some significant structural change in terms of a greener economy. To some extent, some parts of Canada will be dragged into this new economy kicking and screaming. But I think it is inevitable that this structural change will come sooner rather than later. Okay, well, I, th I think in the interest of time, unless there are any more questions, and I don't see any in the Q&A, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Thank you again, Dr. Posadas, for a very stimulating and sort of multidimensional perspective on technology, population, economy, Migration, it's great to see that people are thinking about these things. They're absolutely germane and relevant, not just to COVID, but to the changing topography of technology and innovation and, and to economies. And sometimes we, we forget to think differently about the, the realities of where these trajectories may, may be coming from and where they may be taking us. So I, I really appreciate your insights and your thoughts. And I do encourage people to take a look. I know you've published a few pieces about this kind of work that is, uh, that is available. And uh, I'll thank you again for your time and for your um, keen observations on this. And thank everybody for attending on a Friday afternoon over their, their lunch hour. And uh, remind people again that we do have another seminar scheduled for April 16th. And I will conclude with my um, other word in Greek, which I believe means goodbye, which is yasas. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to link once more with the Prentice Institute and keep up the good work because the Institute has a very relevant and potent uh, think tank in terms of moving our world forward in a better direction. So thank you for the work that you've been doing, Lars, and your colleagues and my friends at uh, the apprentice yes. Thank you, and I and I hope we can see you out here, or maybe I'll see you in New Brunswick in the near future. All right, thank you, everybody. Thanks for attending. Take care. Bye bye.